Today I'm going to uh, give you a little talk about both my research, but also about my activity as an entrepreneur within the circular economy, having started companies both in Portugal and Sweden. Feel free to take anything you see here, steal with pride, no reason to reinvent the wheel. So if you see something, go ahead, take a snapshot, no problem. Let's get started. This is what I am really trying to struggle with, this whole aspect of the future, right? What does the future look like? We're talking about that today in terms of procurement. But we know very little about the future. We, we have to take these decisions about tomorrow based on our knowledge from yesterday. We need to be better at taking a collective discussion around this. We think about it ourselves, but we need to challenge our assumptions and talk with this with people who are not like ourselves. What are possible for scenarios of the future? This is one. This is one concept, called, I believe it's coming from the Netherlands, called Regen Villages. This is a self-sustaining village, right? Where you have renewable energy, you can 3D print your food, you have telehealth, distance work, distance education. What might a, the automobile industry look in a, in a situation like this? What does this type of scenario mean for, say, the future of procurement? This is only one scenario, right? These type of circular villages, circular communities. Another one that's challenging our assumption is very much who said we had to live on land. Lots of projects coming out where saying, hey, we can actually live also in the ocean. And where there's lots of new sources of energy and food and so on. What about all the underwater vehicles that are coming along? In addition, I'm the director of Ocean Data Factory, and we're exploring the use of these new types of drones and so on within the ocean, as well as for collecting data. Now, these are rosy scenarios, right? We also have lots of negative sort of scenarios, which many of them have been caused by today's linear supply chains, this take-make-waste. Here you have a mound of our clothes that ends up in Ghana with the cows eating this. And this isn't just for clothes, this is for all types of electronics and dishwashers, you name it, in Africa, in South America, piling up. It's also going very much into our oceans, right? Something like 13 million tons a year go into the ocean every year of plastic. This is a lot. What does that mean? Well, it's showing that, yeah, it might be ending up in our blood and in our lungs. What does that mean for the future of the health industry? What does that mean for the future of us in terms of our well-being? Another issue that's coming along is this. Anybody know what this is? Scream out if you know what it is. I'd like to get a little bit of engagement. Anybody know? This is a lithium mine, yeah, you probably, yeah, lithium mine in South America. We need to take a holistic perspective. We can't just solve one problem and then create another one. So, many, so much water has to be used in order to create lithium. Think about all the runoff, all the waste from this. This is a huge issue. And not only that, this also might mean that we end up in the ocean with deep sea mining. We don't even yet understand what might happen if we start mining at the bottom of the sea. In fact, one of the things we're working with this ocean data factory is the whole aspect of trying to predict the spread of an invasive species. Can we use artificial intelligence to help us understand that if we start digging there, how might the currents, et cetera, spread this type of species that might have been under the Earth's surface there for a million years or more? We have no idea. So while we have rosy scenarios, we also have kind of scary scenarios, don't we? The project on the left there is a project where, hey, can we use our great global garbage patches and build cities on top of them? Who would like to live there? Or what about on the right, where science fiction becomes science fact as we war over resources and we can't manage to solve our climate challenges? These are also potential future scenarios. So I ask the question to you, and I'd love you to answer, who creates the future? Yeah, we create the future, right? So how do we do this? How do we step, take that step forward? I think one of the most important things is challenging our basic assumptions about the way we do things around here. Exploitation is you continue to do what you're already doing. You do it a little bit better, a little bit faster, a little bit quicker, whatever. 
But are you really solving the right problem? And how do you actually go about exploring I think one thing has to do with the mindset, going from being a problem solver to a solution finder, using your networks to find those solutions, and maybe it's only a piece of the solution. To give you one example, here's a Swedish company called Volta Green Tech, where a KTH a student from one of the universities there explored and said, how can we solve the issue of methane gas emission in the agriculture industry? Now, one solution clearly is let's stop eating meat, but this industry will continue. So how can we make, say, smaller adjustments to this? Well, I heard in the UK they have a research project where they're trying to potty train the cows, building toilets. That's not really solving the issue, is it? What he did is they found research on red algae, you know, algae that grows in the ocean. And if you give a cow 100 grams of red algae a day, you reduce their methane gas emissions by 80%. And not only that, the cow feels better and uses less energy. This is only one example. And I think what's really important too is we take this step back and say, how can we go from this linear model to a circular economy model? Where we try to think, how can we eliminate waste? How can we circulate and how can we regenerate nature? I just put up the kind of the, one of the first definitions from the MacArthur Foundation. What's important here is taking this holistic perspective, a systems perspective. This is what is needed in order to solve our climate issues. So I'm going to tell you just a little story about how personally I've kind of jumped in a way. I'm still in academia, but I'm taking all my years of research and trying to put it into practice. So here I am in Peniche. Any of you been surfing in Peniche? It's about one hour north of Lisbon. All right, come and visit someday. <laughs> there I am with my son. He's, by the way, he's my reverse mentor, continuously challenging me about the way I do things. And so there we are in Peniche, surfing. But when you look at this photograph, I think back to a, a researcher, Ted Castronova. We researched virtual worlds 10 years ago. And his question was, let's not look at the people in the front of the photograph, let's look at the people in the back. Who is at the back of the photograph? What does their lives, what does their lives look, look like in the future? How will these new technologies influence them? Whether it's virtual worlds or artificial intelligence or robotics or drones. And we started being very curious about this. And we ended up meeting some fishermen in the motorcycle club. And one of the fishermen was Luis Santana. And we learned more and more and more about small, medium-sized fisheries and coastal communities around the world. This was about four years ago. And the more I got into this, the more I realized that we have tremendous issues. You have these coastal communities, which at one point were extremely thriving, thriving, thriving communities. For example, Peniche, which is one of the richest cities in Europe within a few decades went to one of the poorest regions in Europe. We have a bit of a broken economic model, and so there's something we could do. So here I have a little quiz for you. Since I'm a teacher at a university, I like to give quizzes. I'd like you to read one sentence out loud. Everybody ready? Don't worry, you can't fail, it's okay. Okay, let's go. One more time. Opportunities are now here, right? It all depends on how you view the world. If you take kind of ooh, a linear kind of perspective, you see opportunities are nowhere. They are everywhere. It's about seeing what type of trapped resources might be there. Can we apply technologies? Can we learn and look for the issues that need to be solved and use our networks to find solutions? So we jumped right in and created a company in Portugal uh, called Ocean Tech Hub, and an initiative called Peniche Ocean Watch. We started working together with the local fishermen, listening to them, trying to understand their challenges. One of their biggest challenges is very much competing against these very large trawlers that have lots of you know, automation and all types of resources. How can they be sustainable? How can they be competitive? So that's where we kind of started. But we also thought, what else is there that we could actually work with? And so we decided to go jump for it and created this blue circular economy model. It's about four years ago. How can we weave in different technologies to create some type of sustainable, and that I mean viable business model? 
So we started thinking, hmm, maybe we could use AI and drones to help them fish more efficiently in some way competitively. Can we then think about what waste is out there? In fact, 50% of the waste in the ocean or in the, you know, from Europe is from the fishermen. Can we help them, work with them to repurpose their boats to find, say, ghost nets and other fishing waste to bring up? But what will we do with it? Well, why not? Let's think about, we have lots of new materials, nanomaterials like graphene. Any of you working with graphene? Fascinating material, two-dimensional material, lots of interesting characteristics. Could we compound these you know, ground-up fishing nets with graphene and maybe 3D print something new? Well, let's see, what might we be able to 3D print? Well, why not a self-driving vehicle that's solar charged? And could we put it on the blockchain to enable traceability, sustainability, and create kind of this sustainable entrepreneurship model? This was our organizing vision that we started out with four years ago. I'll tell you a little bit about what we've done since then. The first project, we searched around, we found an interesting drone company in Norway, and we started developing this project called the Pelodrone Project. And I'll show a short video here so that you can see all about the Pelodrone. The Pelodrone Project, part of the Peniche Ocean Watch initiative by Ocean Tech Hub LDA. Fishing has long defined the livelihoods of coastal communities in Portugal, with 90% of the industry made up of small to medium-sized fisheries. Yet these fisheries are at risk. Increased investment in automation by large-scale fisheries is driving down competitiveness. Ocean litter continues to threaten marine ecosystems, reducing fish biomass. And reduced opportunities are pushing younger generations to city-based industries casting doubt over the future of coastal communities. With this in mind, we developed Pelodrone, an innovation project that combined state-of-the-art digital technologies to streamline the process of locating and catching pelagic fish. Together with our partners, the Pelodrone project will develop an information service that will equip fishermen with the location and quantities of nearest catches using patented drone technology specifically adapted to Portuguese maritime conditions provided by our partner Birdview. The Pelodrone service will combine artificial intelligence to search for surface-related indicators and use marine scanning devices to identify the biomass below the surface. By increasing search ranges and identification accuracy, we will reduce fishermen's time at sea, their risk, emissions and costs strengthening the competitiveness of their work. The drones will also map coastal waters, providing vital information on extent, location and type of subsurface waste, a problem which presently cost the Portuguese fisheries 60 million euros. Through a blue circular economy model and bilateral relations among Portugal, Norway and Sweden, the Pelodrone project seeks to digitally transform coastal communities bringing in new skills and opportunities that lead to thriving, sustainable futures. As one of the few remaining fishing ports in operation in Portugal, the coastal town of Peniche will be the setting for our first implementation. A fishing community with unique opportunities, fishing has shaped life here for centuries, with some 600 fishermen still active despite a number of economic and social challenges. With its extensive fishing knowledge and strong entrepreneurial mindset, Peniche presents a solid base for future development and the ideal launching point for the Pelodrone project. Co-funded by EEA and Norway Grants. The issue here isn't to enable them to catch more fish because there is a quota system. But by using this type of surveillance system, we can actually cut, reduce their time at sea by about 50%. That's a lot. Think about all those reduced emissions. What's interesting though here as well is that the algorithm in the drone, we can also train that to identify ghost nets at the bottom of the ocean. And so hopefully they will have this time over an incentive as well to actually work on say maybe even bringing out some of this waste if we can do it in a sustainable manner. But there's more challenges ahead. Not only do we have these ghost nets, we also have tremendous amount of nets that are being used every single year and ending up in landfills, they're being burned, they are dumped in the ocean in some countries. 
This is a valuable resource, and already we're beginning to see some organizations, right, working with collecting this. And so we thought, remember back to our blue circular economy model? Well, let's see if we can do something with this trapped resource. In other words, these nets, which is a very valuable material. It's nylon, this, in this case, polyam PA6, polyamide. And our first vision, yeah, let's just turn, shred them, you know, whatever, let's just turn them into pellets. No problem, really easy. Yeah, right. It's interesting to see how you start with one thing and how you actually really have to break it down into all these steps. Remember, circular economy is about this, this holistic perspective, a systems framework. And so this is a very manually intensive process. So we have to work with the local communities looking for labor that might be able to interested in doing such a job. So we're working with one of the local uh, community organizations for people who have a little bit difficulty holding down long-term jobs. And so we're working with them to help us collect, but also with the fishermen so that we can pay back to them. And by the way, we're also trying to implement this blockchain solution to enable the traceability back to the fishermen who've been using these nets in the first place. But what do we actually do with them after we've collected them? Well, the idea is we have to actually then shred them, right? So, I'm sorry. So how do we work with the shredding? We've had to go in ourselves personally because while everybody says, great idea, when it comes down to it, people ask, how do you make this viable? So we bought, we bought a factory, a warehouse, old fishing warehouse. We bought a shredder second-handed, and we started shredding the nets together with volunteers from the local surf school. So again, trying to find these trapped resources, the systems perspective. But what are we actually turning these fishing nets into? And many people are turning them into, say, material that you can use in, say, glasses or shoes and so on, fabrics, which I think is great. But why can't we create products that have a much longer life cycle? And can we use a different form of 3D printing? How many of you have seen one of these large-scale industrial robots that is 3D printing? A few of you. We turned out, it turned out that we could not find this in Portugal. We had to actually network with the people with the Research Institute of Sweden, as well as small startups in Sweden, to find the technology that we needed to actually turn these pellets into something. And hopefully this video will work. Let's see. No, it's not working. It's okay. So what actually are we turning that into? We've tried working with established players, established multinationals, and saying we have this wonderful recycled material. And they say, well, you have to, we have to wait a year. It has to go through you know, lots of tests. And, and then maybe and, you know, it, we compare it to virgin plastic. And there's lots of issues. So we got frustrated and said, well, OK, let's just start our own company. So we started our own company in Sweden called Ekbakken Studios, where what we're doing is 3D printing with one of those large-scale industrial robot 3D printing machines, furniture. And the idea is, can we actually turn waste into masterpieces? Can we redefine luxury? Because recycled goods has a bit of a, you know, kind of a bad kind of swing to it. Can we actually change and, and think about upcycling and turning into something really interesting and luxury in a way? And so here you see some of the furniture that's actually been 3D printed from our fishing nets. Now this is not, yeah, thank you. Thank you. But I must say, this is not sustainable, right? Turning the fishing nets into pellets, shipping them to Sweden and 3D printing, that's not sustainable. Our goal is can we actually rethink supply chains? Can we create networks of local micro factories, right, hubs, where you take in waste, you grind it down, maybe, you know, we're still experimenting with that graphene, remember graphene, and then turn that into something for the local market. So think about Paniche. It's a marine industry there. Could we then 3D print, say, electric motors out of plastic? Well, this already exists. And so the idea is looking for those solutions out there and then bringing them here. But this is a long, this takes a long time. And the whole he idea here is, you know, who picks up the bill for sustainability? It's a long, hard job of, you know, applying for funding and looking for people who want to volunteer. But this is actually really interesting because there is a higher purpose here. If we're talking about attracting, say, Gen Z and other people, they come to you because they say, look at what you're doing. We want to help. 
tomorrow I'm meeting a, a, a person who's a student in Lisbon. He said, I heard what you're doing when you were speaking for the Open Source Summit last week. I want to come and help. I don't want to be paid because, for one thing, I can't because I'm a student in a special program, but I want to volunteer. So we have lots of potential, but what does that mean actually then for the future of supply chains, for the future of procurement, if we have these hubs where we're taking waste and creating, pockets, pocket, I'm sorry, creating products for the local market? And the idea there is that because you have, can make pellets from the material, so say our, our, our furniture there, we're designing them so you can take it apart and then you can grind up the plastic again and produce something new. So you continue this cycle. So this is the goal. But we have to all the time look up and build bridges with people who are not like ourselves. Build bridges with others who are, say, in different countries, at different levels of an organization, different cultural backgrounds. In Swedish, there's an expression, actually it's in English, right? Birds of a feather flock together. In Swedish, you say something like, yeah, different children uh, don't play together, but actually, when they do play together, they create new games. And I think there is something to that. When you bring together people with different interests and different views of the world, it's amazing what you can create. And this is what's required to solve our climate challenges and tackle this. And so just to give you one example, I wonder about the battery in this thing. There we go. To give you one example, I have a PhD student who I hired from Ghana. I had no idea what she would bring to the table. It turns out she did her own exploring and found a UN project in Ghana where they are really working with circular economy already. And in fact, this man here already has a circular micro factory where they're working with the local community to bring in old bottles and plastic bottles and so on and turn them into new things for the local market. They're not using 3D printing, they're using compression, but fascinating to see that he already has 30 employees in this local factory that is working for circular economy. And in fact, Deborah, who you see here working for Footprint Africa, she has already mapped out 500 different circular economy initiatives in Africa and is working constantly with building networks within different areas related to the circular economy. So there are lots of solutions out there, but it's how we actually use our networks, right, to find them. So I'm gonna end here with one more little quiz for you. Here are two individuals, A and B. It's a very simple social network diagram. They both have five relationships, right? Five little nodes coming out. And I can ask the question to you, which one of these is, say, more innovative, sees more visions of the future, is able to find different solutions, is able to like, wow, take on perhaps the circular economy. It's impossible to say, see, isn't it? You have to go one step further. When we think about our networks, we tend about just our first link. We need to go one more link out. What do the networks look like of the people who we network with? And then I can ask the question, which one of these two individuals is more innovative, is more, is more successful as a solution finder and taking on our challenges and becoming more of this, creating a systems framework. Which one? What? I didn't hear you. B, yeah, exactly. A is the same knowledge going round and round and round. You're already doing what you're already doing a little bit better. Remember exploitation, exploration. A is all about exploitation. Think about your own networks. What do they look like? Start building bridges with people who are not like yourself. Build them before you need them. Because when you do this, it's actually about solving our challenges. Collective intelligence. No one knows everything. Everyone knows something. All knowledge resides in humanity, said Pierre Levy. I say, is that really the case? Actually, I think it's about this, that all knowledge resides in networks, right? We are connected to everyone on the planet through six degrees of separation. Although now, as internet penetration is raising, rising and rising, it's about 5.7, 5.8. What will happen when we get 90, 95% penetration? We have access to all the knowledge, all the networks that we need to take on our global challenges. So we, I know that we have the potential to do this. 
If any of you would like to learn more or jump in and help out or something, feel free to uh, reach out to me or to Mafalda, who's a, a Swedish Portuguese helping us with our project in Portugal. So if you love knowledge, set it free. Thank you.